Good evening. I'd like to call this meeting of the City of Urbana Council's Committee of the Whole to order. Will the clerk please call the roll? Mr. Here. Evans. Mr. Brown. Here. Mr. Jacobson. Here. Mr. Madigan. Ms. Marlin. Here. Mr. Roberts. Here. Mr. Smythe. Here, I think. Mayor Pressing. Here. <laughs> Next on the agenda is approval of the minutes from the April 10th meeting. Is there a motion to approve? Yeah, I'll make the motion. Second? Second. Second. Motion by Mr. Roberts, seconded by Eric Jacobson. Are there any additions or corrections? Okay. All those in favor of approving the minutes, please say aye. 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 All those opposed, same sign. Okay. Are there, we have one addition to the agenda, which will be a proclamation. Are there any other additions to the agenda? I see an addition to the council arriving. We do have an addition to the council arriving. <laughs> okay, first up is public input and we'll begin with the proclamation. Okay, this is a proclamation about historic, National Historic Preservation Month. Whereas historic preservation is an effective tool for managing growth, revitalizing neighborhoods, fostering local pride, and maintaining community character while enhancing livability, and whereas the city of Urbana has a historic preservation plan and currently has locally designated 18 local historic landmarks and three historic districts, and whereas historic preservation is relevant for communities across the nation, both urban and rural, and for Americans of all ages, all walks of life, and all ethnic backgrounds, and whereas it is important to celebrate the role of history in our lives and the contributions made by dedicated individuals in helping to preserve the tangible aspects of the heritage that has shaped us as a people, and whereas the greenest building has already been built, building reuse typically offers greater environmental savings than demolition and new construction, and whereas reusing existing buildings is good for the economy, the community, and the environment, and whereas in May, the Urbana Historic Preservation Commission is hosting many educational events in observance of National Historic Preservation Month. Now therefore I, Laurel Lunt Pressing, Mayor of the City of Urbana, do hereby proclaim May 2017 as National Historic Preservation Month in the City of Urbana, Illinois, and call upon the people of Urbana to join in their fellow citizens across the United States in recognizing and participating in this special observance. Okay, and to yeah. the preservations, I think, and to follow on that, uh, Alice Novak would like to speak. And I'll, I'll present you with the proclamation, Alice. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much for getting us off to a great start for Historic Preservation Month in May. Um, this year, the commission has three activities planned, and I hope to see all of you there. Yes, all of you. Uh, <laughs> we're following a model that we started last year, and that is a Wednesday night lecture at the Urbana Free Library, followed by a Saturday morning tour that starts at the Market on the Square that has the same theme that the Wednesday lecture has. So you can come Wednesday night to the library and learn fabulous new things about old buildings, and then put that new knowledge to use in the Saturday tour, in the walking tour. And then we also are doing uh, something we haven't done before this year, and that's um, the Archives After Hours. And Anka Voss, uh, director of the Champaign County Historical Archives, is going to open the archives for us, usually when they're not open, in a on a Wednesday evening, the 24th. And uh, people can come in and bring uh, addresses with them of their own homes or of a place they'd like to know more about, and we'll do hands-on guidance on how to research historic properties. Um, so the uh, commission, Historic Preservation Commission usually doesn't meet, of course, if there's not business to conduct. But uh, sometime in late February, I emailed Lori P Pearson and I said, you know, we really need to meet, even if we don't have anything else, because we need to talk about planning for Historic Preservation Month. And one of the things that's so cool about how effective we've been able to be is the staff support that we've gotten. And Lori's response was, of course, no problem, we'll, we'll take care of that. So um, thanks to the staff that we've had over the years, um, Kevin Garcia, our planner and Lori Pearson and Rebecca Bird before them. 
Um, and also thanks to the commissioners. We have a really great commission. Everybody um, participates in things. Everybody has something to say. Everybody brings something to the table. And the commissioners are Scott Dossett, Matt Metcalf, Gina Palioso, Dave Seiler, Trent Shepard, and Kim Smith. Thanks very much. Thank you. Next up for public input is Chris Billing, who <clears throat> was here last week, but we finished so quickly and <laughs> didn't even give him a chance to speak. So he kindly came back this week. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen of the council, uh, Ms. Marlin, Mayor Pressing. I'm Chris Billing, 2501 Stricker Lane here in Urbana. I'm here this evening to speak as a co-chair of the Boneyard Creek Community Day event, which is coming up this Saturday, the 29th. Um, this year will actually be our 12th annual event. Uh, the, uh, the City of Urbana is one of the original organizing agencies of the event long ago, and the event engages the community, um, you know, individually and in groups to promote appreciation, stewardship, and naturalizing of our urban stream corridors. Now, over the past 11 years, the event has grown from one meeting site to eight sites throughout the community now. Um, and uh, we've, uh, it went from 50, a little less than 50 volunteers, I think, uh, um, in the first year to something well over 500 last year. Um, and uh, last year also accomplished about 1,460 acres of litter removal, seven and a half miles of shoreline cleanup, and uh, seven acres of invasive species removals uh, throughout the communities. This year we have um, over 40 sponsors and four diff 14 different organizing agencies. So the event really has continued to grow. Uh, in fact, this year we've, the event's now expanded into Savoy, so now we encompass Urbana, Champaign, Savoy, University of Illinois campus, so it's, uh, it's, it's getting quite large. Uh, in fact, I think this morning, as of this morning, we had about 560 advance registered on the website, so it's already a bit more participants than we had last year, and I, I think we'll expect some more. So. I'm really just here to thank you for your continued support, uh, both financial and an allocation of staff time during the planning of the event uh, and on the day of the event uh, and afterward. And I and hope that this continues year by year by year for another 12 years or so at least. So thank you very much. Thank you, Chris. And last of the public input speakers will be Robin Arbiter. My name is Robin Arbiter. I um, live at 109 West Illinois. I'm here on behalf of the Learman Neighborhood Action Committee to say thank you to outgoing Mayor Laurel Pressing and um, to this iteration of the City Council. Um, next week you'll install a new mayor and a couple of new council members. But before that happened, LNAC participants um, would like to say thank you to this group of people. Um, in 2009, Mayor Pressing came to the very first community meeting called by Dennis Roberts to discuss community needs in the Learman neighborhood. <clears throat> Mayor Pressing, at that time, you offered us the resources of the city. And um, out of that meeting, the Learman Neighborhood Action Committee was born. And since 2009, you have kept your promise and made the resources of the city easily available to LNEC and um, to other neighborhood groups. Because you took action as the liquor commissioner, um, a business supporting crack use and violent crime left the neighborhood. Because you came to um, the neighborhood to celebrate our shared accomplishments, you helped residents feel welcome in the city chambers. Because you found a way to budget a small water line extension, we were able to make our garden a long-term resource for the neighborhood. And for these and many more actions, we thank you. Um, Mayor Pressing and council members, you have all acted many times 
to support a healthier, happier Learman neighborhood, most recently supporting our plea to keep video gaming parlors out of close proximity to residential neighborhoods and um, schools. And while not everyone understands the necessity of bike paths, the council's support of bike routes means safer support, safer movement rather, for those residents who walk and ride to school, work, and shopping out of necessity. Your efforts to hold landlords financially responsible for unsafe conditions in some of Urbana's rental complexes um, resulted in the closure of properties unfit for living and to the largest fine against a landlord in Urbana's history. We thank you for that, for sending a serious message to slumlords. Your actions supporting Councilman Ammon's proposal, which led to the dropping of the marijuana possession fine from what, $300 to $50, um, brings greater economic equity and means less disruption of family, school, and work life for lower income households, and we thank you for that. From LNAC's earliest days, Dennis Roberts has been a steadfast co-founder and partner. He, Diane Marlin, and Bill Brown um, have given countless hours to our cleanup days, garden harvests, and distributions, as well as many behind-the-scenes initiatives. We thank you for your work and for the relationships you have built with residents and groups. We thank you for being bridges between the neighborhoods. When you all set council goals for the past term, you made several that supported the Learman neighborhood residents' self-initiated goals. These included improving connections from Aspen Court to Philo Road during redevelopment, supporting the garden at Learman and Washington, and progressing on redevelopment plans for Aspen Court and the now demolished Urbana townhomes. We thank you for taking our goals seriously, for incorporating them into your plans, and for the efforts you made in these areas. It is our sincere hope that the incoming council and mayor will carry forward these and other goals. Finally, although he is not here, we thank now retired police chief Patrick Hunley, we want to just say this publicly, um, for his commendable community outreach and open door policy, and for the care his officers have shown to many of our neighbors who are mentally ill and in distress. The Chief's openness to sharing calls for service data in the early days of ILNAC helped organizers understand some of the area's needs for healing and treatment services. There was no time in our years of organizing ILNAC that the Chief did not make himself or his officers available to answer questions, share reports, attend meetings, or join us for celebrations. Our best wishes to you, Mayor Pressing, and to you, members of the council, as you continue your journeys elsewhere or in these chambers, we will always appreciate our time with you. And um, Mayor Pressing, we have some seeds from our zinnia bushes at the garden, <laughs> and we hope that they will be something you can enjoy elsewhere. Well, I want to thank you for all your wonderful organizing abilities, and there's nothing more powerful than people just talking to each other and figuring out what they'd like to do in their neighborhood, and every city is made up of neighborhoods, and we've got great neighborhoods in Urbana, so thank you for all your work. Many seeds were planted on Learman Avenue over the years. Uh, did anyone else wish to address the council at this time? Okay. We'll move on to staff report. Oh, I'm sorry. Presentations are next. Sorry. With the CU Jazz Festival. Well, first of all, thank you for um, inviting me to pr um, present to you this evening. Um, I'm Janelle Orcherton, and I'm the um, artistic director of the Champaign-Urbana Jazz Festival. Um, we are pretty new um, to Champaign-Urbana, so I thought I would show a few of our points on our mission statement um, and a few I wanted to highlight. We wanted to um, elevate this particular area in Urbana as a destination for music. Um, 
We want to provide opportunities for focused and quality social interactions, and we want to support and showcase um, both local and regional musicians, but also businesses um, that are also working with us um, to bring that music to the community. And we also want to promote a, um, a sense of enjoyment. Um, there's nothing, in my opinion, there's nothing quite as fun as a live musical experience, and um, we want to provide that for people. Um, so highlights from our 2016 festival, um, these were all um, really great highlights for us. We had the Jazz Brunch, which was new last year. Uh, we were able to feature our one of our main artists. He was willing to stay over an extra day. Um, we had our the first regional um, jam session sponsored by a, a very large company, um, which they were very happy with. Um, we, had, we had a VIP party for donors and sponsors um, with a private um, co a concert as well. We were able to expand our Young Artist Series, um, which is a, an arm of our festival that we feel is really important to cultivate um, uh, local artists specifically. So this year we were able to have um, several large ensembles ranging from middle school up to um, early college, as well as um, some small ensembles as well. And we were able to premiere a website and have some professional photography, which really added um, some, some nice professional sheen to our, our public image. And here's some nice photos we had. You can see here uh, the bottom left, um, he's a saxophonist from Chicago. He was at the jam session. Um, and we had our uh, ribbon cutting to start off the event and uh, some, some students there at the, the Young Artist uh, event. And then the two on uh, diagonal corners, that's John Mulder. He was our feature artist um, last year. So he was playing there at the Iron Post, you can see. That was um, a sold out event, um, really energetic. You can see they're caught in the act there. And then the top left one, that was at the Jazz Brunch on Sunday morning. Um, it was him and Larry Gray. We were able to meet and talk with them. People really enjoyed the good food and the great music too. Um, so even though this is only our third year, we have had growth um, each of our years. So last year we had over 450 people attend our four days, um, both local and regional attendees. And um, we've been profitable uh, both our years, which I think is, is uh, pretty great since we're still growing and we started off pretty small with just two days. Um, so this year we're hoping to also be four day, uh, four day festival as well. Um, we've had a lot of community support, um, and our partners include the university, both the School of Music and the Jazz Department, um, lots of local, or I guess the, the local music stores, um, and then a lot of uh, downtown Urbana performance venues, and we had a few in Champaign um, last year. I believe most of the events were downtown. Um, we had corporate and private donors. Uh, we worked with both our public libraries, Champaign and Urbana and we had over $650 in in-kind donations. Um, and uh, the reason I was excited to bring the festival to your attention is we're looking to, um, to partner with the city to continue our growth and reach um, a more diverse crowd. We, we've had really good um, track record so far uh, in growing, but we think this would be a great partnership. Uh, we'd like to continue to work with downtown businesses um, to build culture, cultural and business vigor and continue to highlight and develop um, local musical talent. And again, um, elevate Urbana as a jazz and festival destination. So um, I'd just like to say thank you for letting me uh, bring this to you. This is, uh, again, a little snippet from our, our brunch on, on the Sunday um, that we'll hopefully have again this year. Any questions? Aaron. So thank you for the presentation, and I look forward to Thank you. I forgot how to do that. <laughs> uh, so I saw a picture of uh, some young people mm -hmm. playing. It, what, which group is that? Is that the Banks, Bridgewater, and Lewis group? Um, no, they weren't. Um, they That was a different group that was featured. They did play last year. Um, that was the um, Edison, uh, one of the Edison bands that played. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. okay. Um, and the... You said you have some featured artists, but everything is already set for this year. Um, not not exactly. We're still um, sourcing artists. Uh, yeah, we're still working on that. Did you have someone in mind? Yes, I do. Oh, I have a couple okay. Of people in mind. I, I can reach out to you. And we can yeah, talk that'd be great. So, mm -hmm. so just reach you here at the yep. email address. Yep. All right. Thank you. And when is the jazz festival? Um, it'll be in October again this year. Yep. We we wanted to put it um, sort of 
right before it gets cold, we'd like to do some outside things hopefully this year um, and then sort of you know squish it in between the fall events. But we found October is a, is a really good time. Do you have particular dates or not? You don't know the? Um, we're looking at uh, the weekend of the 12th, 12 to 15. I think the 12 is the Thursday. Eric, just go. just thank you. I mean, this this really fills a niche in our in our downtown, and uh, I think I think it's really great that you're doing this. Thank you, Bill. I just wondered if you were aware that the place next to Crane Alley is going to be a new Lo New Orleans jazz. Bar. I'd heard about that. Yeah, I'm very yeah, so interested. I'd love to co-market something with them. That'd be October. great. Yeah. They should be open pretty soon. I think. I think. Yep, that'd be great. We'd love to have put some people there and work with them. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Now we have staff reports. Libby Tyler. Good evening. Um, I hope you have some time tomorrow. There's so much going on right now, but uh, just for example, tomorrow there's uh, Connections Over Coffee tomorrow morning, 7.30 to 9 a.m., and this is at uh, Habitat for Humanity Interfaith Build Home in Urbana at 1203 Beslin, and that's the Urbana Business Association Connections Over Coffee. Then comes lunchtime, and we're gonna have our first um, food truck rally of the season. So food truck rallies are back, so tomorrow we'll be back at the Civic Center parking lot from 11 a.m. to 2 p.m. You'll have your evening free, so we know you're interested. Everybody's a pedestrian, so we're, we know you're interested in um, participating in one of the several meetings on the Urbana Pedestrian Master Plan. Tomorrow evening's meeting will be uh, focused on West Urbana and downtown Urbana. It will be taking place at Pizza M from 5.30 to 7 p.m. And there's a whole um, host of other meetings. Some have been held and some are upcoming on Thursday from 5 to 7 at the Cranert Center Uncorked. We'll be talking about the University District. May 2nd, 7 to 8.30 at Yankee Ridge School for South and Southeast Urbana. May 4th, 5 to 6.30 at the, here at the City Building, and this will be for Central Urbana. And then May 6, 8 to 11 a.m., market at the square. And I think that will be for anybody interested in participating. But even if you're outside of these neighborhoods, you're welcome to participate. Um, in addition to being pedestrians, many of us are bicycles, might bicyclists. So uh, Bike to Work Day is fast approaching. That will be next Tuesday, May 2nd. Um, and we will have energizer stations as we normally do. Uh, downtown and lots of other bike month events uh, you can go to cubikemonth.org to find out more Kelly Murkowski has um, something she would like to talk about an incoming grant that we'd like to give you a uh, heads up on that as well as our social service funding Yes, the first thing is we have a copy of the agreement that we received for the abandoned property program that we um, were awarded from Illinois Housing Development Authority. And um, because of the time sensitive, um, it will be brought directly to council next week for vote. But we thought that it, you had the agreement and you could review that and then you would um, be prepared for that. So, let's see, take one and pass it on. <coughs> and then the second item is the um, consolidated social service funding. Um, applications came in and now we are in the next step of CD with all of the applications and several of the matrices. One on there shows the last three years of funding that was received. 
And then I also have a hard copy, which is this is also on the um, CD as well, um, showing the agencies, the, their uh, program in specific, their percentage of clients that they serve in Urbana, and then what they're requesting. And then each column has specific ward, mayor, and um, Cunningham Township Supervisor, which you can then fill out. Um, I can also email this, and like I said, it's also on the CD. And um, the new council will also um, get this CD as well. So if anybody wants, okay, <laughs> okay. So um, if anybody wants a hard copy, I'll pass. Um, if not, um, I can take that. So with that, those are the two items that I had. I have more CDs as well. So any questions for Kelly? Yes. Kelly, the, could you tell us a little bit more about, so what exactly is this? It's a grant for abandoned properties? Um, yes. Uh, we, um, it's similar to the blight reduction program grant that we would received um, through IDA, but it's a different funding source. Um, and so um, so it, it um, also works with um, demolishing, um, we can't acquire properties, but um, it is uh, for demolishing and um, and we can go back um, at least a year or so and so we have looked at and we're working with uh, building safety and public works on different properties so um, so that's all right thank you mm -hmm. Dennis and the demolitions are for uh, residential properties yes. or commercial residential residential mm -hmm. only. Okay. Any other questions, Aaron? Just on the social service funding, will we see on the, I can't remember from last time, if we had the actual amounts that were awarded prior? Um, yeah, there um, on the CD, there is a, an Excel worksheet that shows agencies and what they've like received over the last three years. If it's blank, it's because either they're, they didn't receive funding, um, and so that wasn't put in, but. So um, this is all? this year's request okay yes all right any other questions are there new uh, applicants this year I think there was a couple couple will, new will they be making presentations to the council like they they in can the pass yes they can certainly do that and that was something I was going to ask as well if there was um, I'm assuming sometime in May um, we can and I mm -hmm. whenever we do this we always let agencies know that they may have to come to do a presentation so they are okay. all aware so um, if you look at your list um, and you see that there's some that you uh, would like to have come and present mm -hmm. I can certainly contact them and let them know to come okay any other questions okay Aaron Eric sorry so last year the total amount that we awarded was, I believe, two hundred and fifty thousand. Mm -hmm. And um, well, we 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 don't have a budget for next year yet. Um, but I guess my inclination would be for people to target that total, and then if it's necessary to make adjustments, we can. Um, you know, do that as we, uh, you know, once we have established the total budget number. Does that make sense to others? At this point, yeah. Are you volunteering to coordinate again this year? Oh, I, I'm willing to do that, yeah. Great. Any other questions? Okay. This is one of the first tasks that new council members um, get to participate in. <laughs> and, and I guess if, uh, if you all come to Crane Alley after the meeting, since you're not currently on the council, we can brief you all on, you know, <laughs> the background to this. The slippery slope there. <laughs> <laughs> and the good news is you no longer get a stack of papers this tall. So. Okay, moving on. Is a discussion on reestablishing the Boneyard Creek Commission. 
Alderman Roberts. Yeah, um, thank you for the time here. Um, this is a topic that uh, has kind of come to my attention over the last couple of years. And it all began when we did a walkthrough of the Boneyard Creek in September of 2015. Uh, the City Council met and walked through that section of the creek that's uh, in between uh, Main Street and Springfield with uh, the property owner and also the creek commissioner and some members of the City Council and uh, staff to look at uh, some of the issues of erosion and soil subsidence, um, a sinkhole, and uh, structural damage to properties along the creek bed. And it led to uh, a discussion um, in September during one of the meetings of the Urbana City Council where we talked about uh, the process of um, the uh, awarding of uh, creek permits and the bonus points in relationship to the creek uh, district and its floodplain. And one of the reasons why that also came up was that we had uh, proposed developments um, along Springfield. We had some house demolitions along Springfield and on Main Street north of that in the area that we walked through. And some of the uh, issues that came from uh, working with the developer and, and interacting uh, brought to our attention that there were, um, I would call deficiencies perhaps in the process which seemed to uh, not allow a very sufficient amount of public interaction in decisions which would actually be very significant for the community. The erection of buildings near the creek, um, you know, and uh, the uh, discussion about uh, awarding uh, bonus points or uh, I guess you'd call them waivers of uh, the normal uh, zoning in the district to um, account for or to uh, to uh, kind of incentivize um, uh, development in an area that is uh, potentially prone to uh, you know occasional flooding and has subsidence issues and um, other kinds of concerns, environmental and um, uh, even you know construction value concerns which have to be discussed and uh, well thought out. And it came to my attention that the meetings were done on an administrative level. Um, and whereas most of these kinds of um, property, uh, property development and property uh, ownership um, questions would be done either in the planning commission or um, in a commission where uh, the public would have an opportunity to sit in, perhaps make comment, through public participation um, and also be advised of the, the, um, the conversation, there just wasn't the same kind of transparency in the process. We have here um, a, um, a staff administrative meeting where uh, these decisions are made. Uh, we do have a, a Boneyard Creek um, commissioner without a true commission. There's nobody on a commission. It's basically a, a staff level a decision. And uh, the, the things that are being awarded to the developer um, concern uh, the development of, uh, development of rights transfers using additional or adjacent properties, um, extra lot size, uh, which uh, allows the property, the, uh, the floor area ratio or the FAR to be determined from the center of the creek um, to the rest of the property lines, which kind of allows a larger um, floor area ratio. Um, and also uh, minimum setbacks uh, requirements can be waived so that the, um, which would allow a maximum development on the property and might lead to allowing the buildings to be uh, one story taller than would normally be allowed in that zoning area. And also it uh, would allow 
um, off off-site parking so that if you're going to make a development you don't necessarily have to provide the parking on your own property to accommodate your residences but you can site them on a lot as far as 600 feet away and to allow that development to continue to to adequately um, park the cars that are required for the property so um, it seemed to me that it would be better for the better process to have more transparency and to make these issues um, come before a real commission uh, of maybe three to five members with of course staff input and help so that the public would have a sense of the progress of any kind of de development along the creek and actually have a say in it and that so um, my proposal that's coming before you is um, to have staff begin working on the recreation of the Boneyard Creek Commission, uh, you know, with uh, you know uh, perhaps five individuals serving on it, with with the uh, the Boneyard Creek Commissioner, to have staff support, and to address some of the uh, procedural processes, which would allow it to operate like any other uh, commission within the city. And I'm saying here that um, that the tree commission, the um, design review boards, the um, historic preservation commission, the bike and pedestrian path commission, they all have um, regular meetings, announced meetings. Uh, the results of the meetings are posted on the website. Um, their meetings are you know, for the most part um, recorded to be televised at a later date so the public can be aware of the decisions. And uh, that this is a better process for uh, for um, deciding things that ultimately are uh, determined and they affect the zoning, uh, zoning decisions within the city. Now, I did talk to uh, Lori Pearson and her department and she did bring up the, the question about um, well, would every time that you wanted to move a communication poll or something have to come before such a commission? And I think that you know those questions could be worked out in the process of drafting the commission ordinance, so that it's not um, onerous to um, small activities within the creek bed area, but that when it comes to new construction or the changing of the footprint of a building. Um, or any kind of excavation that we would have a better chance to review the process uh, as a public because these are more significant developments within the creek bed area. Um, you probably know that that uh, there has been quite a bit of interest most recently in developing a, you know, the creek from the improvement area in the downtown westward to the U of, U of I campus. Um, that is an unplanned section of the Boneyard Creek currently. And my interest is to, to bring resources to bear to um, start to plan for that to be more inclusive as part of an overview of the complete creek bed between uh, the, from, from end to end within the Urbana City area. So that we have a we have a, a gap in planning, which is an important gap because it leads from our downtown to the the U of I campus, and if we were to develop that in a way that was similar to uh, the planned development that we have now in the central section of our city, that could become an important amenity um, and a con and a connectivity trail for bikes, pedestrians, and um, and, our, and um, recreation. So that's an important goal, and uh, we have, I've been, I have been before various commissions and uh, agencies in the in the community, who are strongly supportive of creating such a plan, and these include our own sustainability advisory commission, our own bicycle and pedestrian advisory commission, also the Champaign County Regional Planning Commission. So that's a county agency. And also the uh, UPD, the Urbana Parks District. And even at this point, 
Um, we have had uh, interest from professors at the Department of Landscape Architecture who think that uh, working on such a plan would be an excellent student project, studio project in the coming year. So I see that the other reason to create a Boneyard Creek Commission would be to help to coordinate those kinds of activities, perhaps um, as a, a, a subcommittee within that commission, but it would be a place where people could turn to meet and discuss and perhaps find um, funding to create a more substantial plan. And of course, I want to keep this within the city and the, and the jurisprudence of our uh, own um, planning department. But of course, the planning department um, has plenty of work to do, and a commission of enthusiastic um, members could probably do quite a lot in outreach and community building to create such a plan. So, um, so, th so this plan has kind of two points. One is to build something that allows transparency and public input, which is common to all the commissions that we do have already. And to give this commission the, um, uh, the task of bringing together uh, planning for the future, because without a future plan, um, our, this connectivity trailway would not be built. And uh, so I've actually worked with uh, our current Boneyard Creek Commissioner, um, Clark Bullard, on um, preparing kind of like a tentative draft, which we thought would be useful because we don't want to give the um, city staff um, lots and lots of work to help create this process. And since we already have templates on hand within the um, zoning ordinances of how such um, such commissions are constructed, we just used a template of one of, the, one of the design commissions, which also is a commission that only meets as needed, um, or you know, when there's a project before it, uh, as a as kind of like a master's um, format for a possible amendment to our planning ordinances. We realize, of course, that any plan that that gets drafted, you know, with the help of staff, would come back both to the council and to the planning commission for review and approval. And I'd like maybe Clark Buller to come forward and. Just make some comments if he wants to, to um, add his point of view as the commissioner of the Creek Bed, um, Boneyard Creek Commission, uh, if there was only one. Thank you. I have some comments here, four minutes. Uh, first, I'd like to thank Chris Billings for reminding all of you how there is a real growing interest among people in the community about Boneyard Creek, uh, particularly since the activities on the campus and Champaign have transformed it in that area and downtown Urbana. Uh, I've been your Boneyard Creek Commissioner for 12 years. It's a typical volunteer appointment. I have responsibilities but no authority. Um, I participate in Creekway meetings that are called on short notice and have a few days to review a staff memo and make a quick visit to the site. My duty is to advise the zoning administrator who has the authority to administratively grant permits for construction near the banks of the creek. Those permits often involve granting bonus points. I'm not sure of the relationship between that and a variance, but it sounds very similar to me. Um, and there's a process for appealing the actions of that administrative officer, but I've never seen such an appeal perhaps because of a lack of public awareness of the decisions that are being made. The highlight of my service has been uh, my advisory role five years ago or more in crafting the RFP and selecting a nationally known consulting firm to develop a vision for the Race to Broadway segment, a creative vision that had enough meat on its bones to guide subsequent design and development decision making. My greatest disappointment <clears throat> was having to deal incrementally with isolated construction proposals that might, propo might foreclose the option of laying back the banks of the creek someday or constructing a public pathway along the creek. 
The existing 1976 conceptual plan provides only a vision, hand-drawn sketches of a creek with vegetated banks flanked by a pedestrian cycling trail connecting downtown Urbana to the campus and proceeding all the way through Champaign. It imagines that the steel sheet piling and chain link fencing have been magically disappeared and that future encroachments could be controlled. But here's the difficulty of making those de piecemeal decisions without a plan. A developer might propose construction that would foreclose the option of ever building a public pathway on the north side of the creek. But years later, another piecemeal decision might block the south side on the south bank. So if a path is ever built, pedestrians and cyclists, every time they come to a cross street, may have to traverse diagonally across a bridge. And uh, so 18 months ago, after our walk with many of you along one segment of the creek at the west edge of downtown, I was pleased to hear a majority of the council members favor the idea of revisiting and improving the ordinance. Unfortunately, the planning staff has been unable to follow up. I recognize you've been busy. I've ran a 30-person policy office in Washington for years, and it was a continuous fire drill. The, um, but apparently, due to other priorities, uh, we haven't gotten to it yet. So I ask that you approve Alderman Roberts' proposal to make this process more proactive, transparent, and accountable without placing undue burdens on staff. I believe it's possible. Dennis and I have worked together to identify specific changes in the zoning ordinance that might accomplish these goals. We'd like you to direct the staff to vet the, our proposal, which seeks to strike a better balance between administrative efficiency and public accountability for zoning variances that affect Urbana's major natural asset. A restructured Boneyard Creek Commission could tap the vast reservoir of volunteer talent and experience in our community to think creatively about those unplanned sections of the creek and to help seek funding to develop better plans. A more visible public process for considering incremental encroachments might even elicit offers from policy from property owners to sell or donate easements that could make other segments, some of these segments of the creek, a real asset to the community. The bottom line is I think trading zoning, major zoning variances should not be the only tool available for realizing our vision. The status quo, in my opinion, is slowly but surely foreclosing the option of converting our sheet piled ditch into an aesthetically pleasing parkway. We need a better way to enhance the value of the new residential and office developments that are gradually replacing those century old structures in the Creekway District. Thanks for your attention. Any questions for Question. Clark? Bill? Um, yeah. Um, thanks for coming and explaining some of that. Um, my understanding was the original Boneyard Creek Commission was an uh, intergovernmental body that was more of a design and planning commission. It had uh, like from uh, both cities <coughs> and the planning commission and park districts and things like that. Um, and I think that something like that would probably be useful for that final stretch where we don't have a plan between Strawberry Fields and Lincoln Avenue basically. Um, but I'm not sure, it seems like there's two different things. There's one is kind of the enforcement of the zoning ordinance and potential changes in the zoning ordinance. Um, and then there's a separate thing is kind of future planning that would, I would think, involve more than just a city commission, maybe have a similar intergovernmental thing except without Champaign because they've pretty much, um, they have their plan, they followed it. Part of it was that 70s plan was remarkably accurate in a lot of ways. I mean, they didn't follow it through campus, but they, you know, as mm -hmm. far as detention and things like that, they pretty much accomplished what that, um, what the goals of that were. Um, so I guess my question is, uh, do you see that as two different things? And I know what you've been doing is more of a technical advisor on, on enforcing or um, guiding the, the application of the zoning ordinance. And I've always seen that zoning 
ordinance for the um, basically it's a trade off of they dedicate 20 feet or something of right of way along the creek and then they get all these um, well not all these a few extra um, a few extra ways to incentivize that by by allowing higher building by a floor or something like that and, and remote parking um, and I've always seen that as kind of a temporary thing because nobody had any funding for it and so that was just kind of a um, I thought it would be kind of a something that they they put in place so that in the meantime maybe we'd be able to preserve some stretch along there besides the I think five feet that they have to allow mm -hmm. for we can get in there so we'd fix a sheet pile or something um, so am I thinking of this kind of correctly as far as the the divisions of that and um, the purpose of the original zoning ordinance yes I think opening it up to more input would be very very helpful whether it's intergovernmental or not um, Dennis have, has you know found people and agencies already who are interested in engaging in some proactive thinking to get away from the onesie twosie types of decisions that are that are being made in a process that could be gamed it could be you know it's it's not a perfect process it could be improved um, and and by opening it up to people who might have some ideas and maybe even the courage to talk to some of the landowners along there there's probably a public you know there could be a net benefit from just getting the landowners together in a given block who have plans for building high density housing or whatever on on either side of the creek and th get them to think about how it might be better if they each gave the city an easement or sold the city an easement uh, there are places like the one you walked through that the landowner on the north side owns about 10 or 20 feet on the south side of the bank and that's virtually useless so I, I think uh, it, it's complicated. We could work. Uh, all I think we're asking for is an is a directive to work with the staff to look at the nuts and bolts of the current <coughs> ordinance and how it might be changed, and in a way that you know taps their expertise as well as people from the outside that we can bring in. We may end up, you know, the, in the past, the reason we don't have plans for these other sections is in the past we have waited until we had a project like the Broadway Bridge. And within that project budget, there was money to hire a consultant to start thinking of a plan. That was great. But how long can we wait for the other sections of the creek? That's the main concern. Just Bill. Uh, one follow up. Um, so we have a stormwater master plan study that's budgeted for 2018 2019. Uh, it seems like that should probably be part of the longer term planning. Um, and I haven't seen what you guys have come up with as far as a draft proposal. But um, when they when they do the intent to issue the Boneyard Creek permit, we get a notice. Have you thought about maybe having at that stage it go to the planning commission so that they could just review it um, so that if they wanted to object at least it would it would be at a public meeting um, it would be reviewed in a public meeting they would have the opportunity to object and, and then the public would be aware of it and they would have the opportunity to object so maybe that's my only thought is maybe work that into the process without creating a whole new commission yeah I think that would happen if you would sign up as an opponent and appeal their decision you know ap appeal that intent to issue the permit administratively I think it would automatically go to the c go to the plan commission in that in that case but that's kind of puts you in the role of const of an yeah, obstructionist a little bit before that like right <laughs> yeah, yeah so that it would be at the public plan commission meeting before um, before that was necessary right but you don't want to string out the process too long either we're like a fire department we're on call for whenever a developer comes in with a proposal so 
it's not going to be easy to work out, but I think there are ways to improve it. Okay, thanks. Eric. So just first a procedural thing. I'm totally in support of this. I do hope that we adopt a plan that requires the um, commission decisions to be approved by council. Uh, we, we can really get caught in bad situations when there are related um, issues where one commission isn't, uh, I, I got caught on this and I really felt as though I had been burned where one, one commission has, uh, requires council approval, the other one doesn't. But they may mm -hmm. actually be dealing with substantively the same issue and in this particular case, uh, I could imagine that that would be the case. So I do hope that uh, that these commission decisions will be uh, uh, subject to approval by the council, not because I'm a control freak, but simply because I think mm -hmm. that's procedurally the best thing to do. I think all commission decisions should be. And then in terms of the actual content of what's going on, um, uh, you didn't mention, but I know you know, that the uh, sheet metal structure is failing in a very important way, and that is that it's apparently contributing to subsidence of the land on both sides of the creek. So that structures on both sides, those the creekward side is falling in, and strawberry fields had to abandon their, their staircase and so forth. So it does seem to me that before we really know what to do with structures on those sides of the creek, there ought to be a thorough study on how, I, this is, to correct this may cost a lot of money, but it seems to me that it just has to be faced up to before we decide on a whole bunch of cases as far as building along the creek, because well, I guess it's a sort of biblical illusion we'll be building on shifting sand. Yes, it's complicated. The current path of the water, the groundwater table rises, and then the water has to go, instead of flowing like naturally through creek banks yep. uh, into the bottom of the creek from the top, it goes down around the steel and up through the cracks in the concrete in the bottom. Yep. Uh, it always carries with it a little bit of soil, right. um, and and uh, that's why it's unwise to build in floodplains and on creek banks. Yeah. So, so there, you know, to develop a plan for dealing with that, you have to decide whether you're going to keep putting band aids on the sheet piling, mm -hmm. the concrete that was put on five or ten ten years ago, probably, at the bottom to where it was starting to rust. Um, or whether the end state is going to be sloped banks like mm -hmm. we have in other parts of the area. Yeah, so I, I hope that the commission would, I mean, look at actually doing it right, creating sloped mm -hmm. banks and vegetated banks, and see how much sticker shock that creates. Right, and I, and I think it's, that's a reason for having more than just one person me trying to represent a public interest and technical interests and that sort of thing. But a, a mix on a small commission can still have the staff expertise as well as a little bit broader expertise from the community. People who have built things on ground like that. Right. Mayor Prossing. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, I think when we took the tour, we all sort of agreed that we needed to do the easements. So I don't know which comes first, but you know, if you're going to have a path, you better have the land available mm -hmm. at some point. And I think there's so much talent in this community, and people are really interested in things. And American cities are waking up to the value of waterways. They used to be, oh, let's cover it up. And now it's like, wow, people love water, and we should make it available and beautiful. So I think it'd be a good idea to open it up and have more people on it. And I'd like to see if we could focus on the easements first, because then we have something to start with. Mm -hmm. Any other comments? Libby. I do have some comments to the proposal and some clarification. Um, 
And I appreciate Dennis's presentation, his background, history, and all the work that he's done, and all the service that Clark has provided as our uh, Boneyard Creek Commissioner. So what we've been doing is administering an ordinance that dates back to the late 70s. And it's, very, it's a very awkward ordinance. We wouldn't draft it this way today. Um, it is based primarily on the concept that you gain your easements and your setback along the creek by providing for these bonuses or these waivers or whatever you call it. And there's even a fancy tool that we can't practically use called transfer of development rights. So that was a wisdom back in the 70s. And we also had a very nice master plan done for the creek by this interjurisdictional commission at that time. So the fact of the matter is that we have an out of date zoning ordinance that's awkward to administer, and we have an out of date plan. And this was recognized. Um, and several months ago, there was a discussion at council and beginning to think about, well, let's update the zoning ordinance and let's look at adding a, a plan for this additional stretch. And the action that was taken was um, that Alderman Smythe and Alderman Roberts will start a framework of modifications to the current procedures towards creating a Boneyard Creek Commission, discuss with staff, and bring this back to council. So um, it's not like we were, oh, yeah, let's go, <laughs> let's go write that. Um, we do have the council goals, and, um, but we would appreciate the direction if you've drafted something. That's great. And this is no, nothing foreign to us. We do text amendments several times a year. And you'll see the planning division annual report, and you'll see, yes, we do text amendments, sometimes of a complicated nature, several times a year. We also do plans. We have a whole planning division. We have some very talented planners. They know how to work with uh, lots of different types of plans and different interest groups. Uh, I mentioned tonight the pedestrian master plan. We're, we are working with Regional Planning Commission on that, but oftentimes we partner. And we do have uh, one of our planning staff has expertise and a lot of enthusiasm for Creekway planning. So. We do have the staff to do these things. This is not so um, uh, not so terrific a job. I agree it does need to be done. Um, but I think that we have a structure that we need to follow. And in particular, we're talking about people's property rights. And we're talking about rights in an area where there's been remapping. So some of those property rights have been compromised. And the um, case law has evolved over the ages. In fact, there's case law that um, militates against the whole theory of the 1978 zoning ordinance where you can somehow extract an easement. That's doubtful now, so that makes, makes that a little awkward. So this is, this is something that we really do need to make sure we're doing correctly, top to bottom, technically, that it fits with the rest of the zoning ordinance, uh, with our development review processes, um, I know we can modernize it, we can improve it, the transparency, that's important. We did have another commission that was sort of a funny combination of, um, of staff and outside folks, and it was awkward. You had uh, somehow there were supposed to be unanimous decisions made. There were people who were on this board who were sitting there with their supervisor. That's awkward. And we modernized that. That's the mixed office residential. And we've created three design review commissions, and we're looking at combining them because there's so many common members. We do have a plan commission that's very skilled at development review, and they are. We have we have occasionally brought Boneyard Creek Commission items to them, either as appeal or just because they were such a large project. So that's something to consider. Would this be something that? the plan commission could take on and add to their duties. That might be an option to look at. On the plan, are those two different things? Uh, should the plan have a steering committee, maybe a larger group of interested folks, um, you know, get, get some of these other stakeholders involved? But again, we do plans all the time. We love doing plans. So I don't think that we're at odds. You know, perhaps there's a little communication to complete 
Um, this was something that came in kind of after the goals were set, but it doesn't mean that we don't have it on our list of projects and are waiting for whatever the first pass is. It sounds like there is something that we have not received yet, and I think we're happy to take that on and bring forward a process that works, uh, that protects, protects the city and the residents and the boneyard. I don't think that we need to do like this kind of cloak and dagger in indirect types of actions because we all have the same goals, but we want to do it correctly so it succeeds. Dennis. Yeah, and I, I totally agree with that. Um, I mean, certainly we're going to be working to uh, create a successful product. Um, again, I want to just reiterate that uh, the process that we've been doing to make these bonus points awards have mostly been you know, in staff, um, in the staff conference room, a lot of times staff has already worked with the developer, his architect, and his lawyer before the um, uh, day of the presentation, and that the uh, which is fine because I mean all development projects have to happen that way. But then during the conversation, I, I did attend one uh, for properties along the Springfield side of the creek. Um, there was no uh, public notice. I wasn't aware of the meeting. It's not um, noticed on the website. Um, there wasn't really any way the public would be able to attend the meeting. It was not um, well vetted is what I'm saying. And when you have something that's happening, if you're going to have construction on the creek and you live across the creek from this construction, it's probably as sensitive as the bone as the Busey corridor, you know, as far as um, having uh, a desire to know what's happening and not to be surprised when um, three new buildings appear on the other side of the creek and you had no idea that there was even a concept to do that. So that's why I just want to see more transparency. The fact that we do talk with the developer and there is a plan and we approve it is fine with me and I'm not even contending that bonus points don't have a place to promote development. I just want everybody to be aware that these are going on, get a chance to come in and talk, to look at, review the proposal, have a sense of what the building's going to look like and how tall it is, and get your opportunity to comment on it before the decision is made. I think that's really important for transparency and public input, not for um, stopping or halting progress in the community. Okay, Charlie. <coughs> Um, I would agree with pretty much everything that's been said and just want to reiterate the transparency piece is important be it done by a design review board type commission or as a duty of the plan commission hadn't thought of adding it to the plan commission I, I, I'm I, I think they already do a lot of work so I'd be hesitant to go that route but maybe that is the way to go um, maybe that with a, a more general steering committee that reports to them the important thing here, I think, um, is that we simply need a modern plan that revises the 1970s plan uh, and gives us something to shoot for and uh, provides guidance to everyone who lives and develops along the boneyard, um, something that would reflect the work that's been done by Champaign and the university so that we have a basically a continuous asset from from one side of the communities to the other and uh, reminding people of those of you who sat through my 30 minute presentation on the UC Davis bike system remember that had two pieces to it it had an on street it had on street bike infrastructure for those who liked to be on the street and it had the off street green space connectivity of 15 uh, basically a 15 mile path that connected all their parks and schools and and so on and so that that off road linear path uh, is extremely important to the livability uh, and walkability of a community and i think that's what we're after uh, the park district is is in in our bike master plan has a design in there for connecting their parks with a green a green trail and you know 
this sort of thing goes to supporting that kind of uh, green trail uh, connectivity that would really uh, increase the, the walkability and livability of our community. So however, however the, the next council wants to deal with this, uh, and, and if Dennis, is to, and Dennis and Clark are willing to take the, the lead on uh, finishing what, uh, what, what Dennis has started on, on this, and, and I haven't really contributed to, uh, what I think is really important. And whether we simply say, you know, simply ask these two to go forward and work with staff to bring something to the next council, um, I, I'd be very supportive of that. Well, it sounds like there's general consensus to update the 1978 Creekway plan and then to bring more transparency to the review process, whether that's a separate commission or I preferably incorporate into one of our existing commissions just because it's more efficient use of staff time. But is there a motion? I suppose because I'm interested in it. <laughs> yeah. Any further discussion? Yeah, I, I, I would just say, I mean, we'll duke it out, but I would favor a, a separate commission just because this area has unique issues. Well, that's and, something to duke out, but we got the general right. gist of it. Okay, all those in favor? Uh, aye, aye. Aye. All those opposed? Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Dennis. All right, resolution number 2017-04-022R. A resolution approving a letter of intent agreement, Department of Transportation, U.S. Department of Transportation, Route 45, Cunningham Avenue, <coughs> to provide a shared use path from Kenyon Road to Napleton Way. Bill Gray. Thank you. Um, staff recently received a letter of intent, which was in the packet, <coughs> for improving and installing a new 10 foot wide multi -use, shared use path along the east side of Cunningham Avenue between Kenyon Road and Napleton Way. Um, this is a identified area of a lot of pedestrian activity. Um, either side of Interstate 74, this would help provide that connectivity and would be incorporated as part of IDOT's Cunningham Avenue resurfacing project, which would also include um, bringing up to ADA standards all the sidewalk ramps if they don't meet that standard along the corridor at intersections. Um, this is tentatively scheduled for 2018 construction. IDOT has, um, is willing to pay 80% um, of the cost for the multi-use path, shared use path, which is pretty um, uh, great for our behalf because that's normally a local share, local cost, excuse me. So um, it's an expensive um, shared use path. However, if you think about um, getting a path under the um, uh, bridge, moving streetlight poles, there's ditches that you're going to have to add earthwork, et cetera, mm -hmm. to make the width behind the back of curb wide enough and not right up behind the curb by the highway. So there's a fair amount of earthwork, retaining wall, relocating streetlights, um, the complexity of getting it under the bridge. So it's not an easy um, task as it would be uh, normally for a five foot sidewalk or so. So um, with this letter of intent, um, if the council approves, then there would be a more formal agreement which would essentially encapsulate the letter um, that you have before you. So, uh, and then we would commit to pay our 20% share. Any questions for Bill? Dennis? Bill, um, this is a great path. Um, we had a great idea. We've really thought about this for a couple of years. I mean, I could say 10 maybe. <laughs> and when we did our last, um, when I was on the bus tour with for the realtors, we actually saw a person and we were like on the bus uh, and approaching, um, you know, under the underpass, there was a person walking in the road right there um, at risk. Uh, and you know being it's a dangerous location my question is and you probably have a really good answer would it be smarter to put the uh, connectivity path on the on the west side because then those who use it would not have to cross the highway to get to either their um, 
car that's being repaired or go to shop at the retail outlets that are north of that, including um, Farm and Fleet? The majority of the users, um, the housing, et cetera, is northeast of the intersection of Cunningham and 74. The residential. Correct, yes. So it was felt, um, again, big expense, because to do both sides would be twice the cost, if you will. But um, there was more users, if you will, on that east side. So that was IDOT's thinking. You actually had data maybe about that or not? Or? I didn't actually see the data, so I can't respond to that. This okay. was their assessment, their study, their com their confirmation. Um, okay. Charlie? Yeah, I guess if you just simply go look at the wear on both sides, you can see the wear on the on the east side is significant. You see tire tracks and from bicycles in the mud and things like that. Uh, and you have traffic signals both at at, uh, you'd have traffic signals at each end that would help with, with letting you move from one side to the other. Yeah. Uh, I'm not a big fan of off-road off paths, but uh, when, when, they're, when you've got a lot of sidewalk, or a lot of, uh, a, a lot of uh, driveways and whatnot to deal with, but we've closed up a lot of driveways in that section, and um, you, you are looking at 45 and 55 mile an hour speeds through there. So it, it probably makes a great deal of sense to do this. Not a cheap project, even you know our share of it's not cheap, but uh, I think it has lots of long-term potential and helps uh, develop the empty lot up there that is just waiting for uh, mm -hmm. the right cool. business. So, so I, mm -hmm. I think you know, I, I really support this. It's my Costco up there. Yeah. <laughs> Bill Brown. Um, yeah, I just uh, was going to mention the, the wear pass would probably be a good indication. Every time I've seen people up there, they've been on that side. I think Liberty Commons is at the mobile home park there that has quite a yes. few um, residents. So I think uh, probably a lot of people use that side of the street, and this is a good project. There's not a lot of yeah. um, cross, you know, uh, not a lot of places where it would cross any kind of um, road coming in, just the exits basically. So I think it's perfect for a side path. Would you like to move it? I would move approval. Mm -hmm. Council, right? Oh, right. right. Move to send this to council with recommendation for approval. Second. Any further discussion? No? Yeah, just real quickly, um, since I own a business up there on the uh, on the east side of Cunningham, um, yeah, I will just uh, confirm that I virtually never see anyone walking on the west side uh, okay it's always east side uh, foot traffic and equally as important uh, I've had employees who live in Liberty Commons who have uh, who don't drive and they walk to the restaurant via Perkins Road mm -hmm. because <coughs> it's not safe uh, to come under the uh, to come along uh, 45 there so they, they walk way out of their way uh, to get to work uh, to avoid that area. And I think uh, connecting to, you know, the, the multi-use path that has uh, just been constructed makes a whole lot of sense. Okay. All those in favor of sending this to council, please say aye. 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 All those opposed? Okay. Resolution number 2017-04-023R, which is a resolution approving the Champaign-Urbana Solid Waste Disposal System Annual Budget. Good evening. I'm uh, Brad Bennett, one of the Assistant City Engineers. Um, what I'm here before you tonight is for approval of the CUSWARS, which is the Champaign-Urbana Solid Waste Disposal System um, site. These are the landfills that are adjacent to the Landscape Recycling Center. Um, as part of the Hoseman Agreement, which closed one of the 10-acre site, landfill sites, uh, every year the council has to approve the, uh, the annual budget for the facility. So what you have before you tonight is the budget that has been approved by the two uh, Cusward co-chairs, Mayor Pressing and City Manager Dorothy David. Um, you can see the city's contribution for this upcoming fiscal year would be $19,494. It's actually down $282 over what it was for the previous fiscal year. 
Uh, we do get $10,487 of that back to compensate the city for uh, the city staff time in administering it. Um, for the operational expenses, uh, like I said, that $10,487 covers our staff time. There's also $55,536 in, um, I'm sorry, $536 in uh, operating costs, and that goes primarily to the, the groundwater and surface water monitoring as well as maintenance activities. We do collect and pump leachate out of the 24-acre site. Uh, we also do vegetation management. We try to remove the woody debris and repair the landfill cap. So you'll notice this year's operational expenses are a little bit higher because we're trying to do some increased vegetated clearing um, out at the 17-acre site. Um, there's some concerns about leachate buildup, so we're going to be looking at the cap condition and possibly making some repairs. Uh, so with that, I'll present it to you, and I will give you an update, too. We do an annual monitoring report on the, the landfill site, and the good news is, you know, completing this year, we still have no uh, evidence of any off-site contamination from the landfill site, so. Charlie. Uh, with great pleasure, I, I'll move this for the last time to send it to council on my part uh, the last time uh, to council with a recommendation for approval. I'll second. With no cuss words, right? No Aaron. cuss words. <laughs> I don't know if it should be appropriate for you um, to answer or if, if Bill or somebody else, but I'm getting a lot of questions for the, uh, there's a lot of work being done now on the lateral, not laterals, excuse me, the uh, the main line. Uh, for stormwater well, and Aaron we need to vote on this first oh okay my fault. we have a we have a motion on the floor right. any further discussion on this motion all those in favor of sending this to council please say aye aye, aye. aye. all those opposed okay okay so I'm just trying to understand exactly what's taking place over there a lot of questions are coming to me about what's I don't know if it's the sanitary district or is it us that are working on the the main uh, leading out to uh, I don't know if it's storm water. I'm trying to figure out if it's storm water or or this is kind of up in the northwest section of the city. The, the sanitary district is doing some sewer lining of their interceptor, so they've actually been doing some bypass pumping and have had a couple of street and lane closures up there associated with that project. But what they're doing is essentially putting a new pipe inside the existing pipe. But while they do it, they have to bypass the flows that normally go through that pipe. So that's what the activity has, has been. It actually started in Champaign and just kind of touches the edge of Urbana. Uh, it doesn't go too far into Urbana, but it does affect like Wright Street, and I think Romine uh, was affected, uh, and Matthews. But there's a couple street closures, but that's all a, a sanitary district project on one of their big interceptor mains that actually carries wastewater from Champaign. So, so from a jurisdictional st uh, standpoint, those houses that are connected to the main um, is that how do how do we regulate that well generally individual houses aren't connected up to the interceptors usually the houses are collected or connected up to what we call collector sewers which is what the city owns the district pipes are usually pretty large they're usually like 12 inches up to 48 inches in diameter mm -hmm. so usually the district uh, sewers are just carrying all the sewage that it's picking up from the collector sewer so generally there's not many houses that are cooked up to the uh, interceptor. There's always exceptions to that. Unfortunately, sometimes there are, but I know nowadays the district does not allow houses to be hooked up to the interceptors, and they've generally you know, tried to avoid that situation. And so they have the jurisdiction. They make the determination. If there's a house hooked to the interceptor, they can say, hey, you have to unhook that and hook No, it. They, they can't unhook them. Um, you know, they would have to work with the property owner. And we do have some areas in Urbana where because of the sewer coverage, I mean, you do run into where there's only an interceptor available, but that's more of the, um, the uncommon case. I mean, most houses are hooked up to a city collector sewer that then discharges into a, a district interceptor. Well, there's a situation that I know of for sure mm -hmm. where a house is hooked direct to the main interceptor. Mm -hmm. It has become uncoupled or it's no longer hooked to it so now the homeowner is possibly being told that they have to reroute it, their line to the city's um, I guess in I mean we'd be glad if I could talk to you and get their information we'll work with them and generally we've been in the past have been able to get the district to allow them to remain connected because we don't want to impose any more expense on a individual than what they have to so if you can get me the information I'll work with the property owner I'll and the district to. to get a good resolution. All right. Great. Thank you.
Next up is resolution number 2017-04-024R, which is a resolution approving the City of Urbana, Champaign-Urbana, Champaign County Home Consortium Fiscal Year 27-2018 Annual Action Plan. Ke Kelly Murkowski. Yes. Um, so before you um, this evening is a resolution approving our Annual Action Plan for 1718. And the issue is to review and make any recommendations regarding the annual action plan and to provide input regarding uh, proposed allocations of funding. Currently are in the 30-day com comment period, which will end on April 25th, and staff will incorporate any public comments and input that is received and um, to put into the final action plan, which is due to HUD um, by May 15th. Um, all project, all budget activities will be proportionally increased or decreased from the estimated funding levels to match actual federal allocation amounts once the city is notified of its allocation and prior to submission of the annual action plan to HUD, um, as recommended by the HUD field staff office in Chicago. Um, our fiscal year 2017-2018 annual action plan includes budgets for the Community Development Block Grant and the Home Partnership Investment Program. Most of our programs and activities are at same levels of funding, except for um, an increase in our program delivery and under Community Development Block Grant due to um, increased staff expenses, and also our neighborhood cleanup, which we are decreasing from two cleanups to one cleanup due to rising costs and limits in funding resources. Um, also in the memo, uh, we listed different budget scenarios, one in, at the same level, one with a 10% decrease, and one with a 10% e increase, also recommended by HUD staff. And tomorrow night at our Community Development Commission um, meeting, they will be reviewing the annual action plan also, and if they have any comments, we will provide those next week at the City Council meeting. So um, this staff recommends um, that this resolution be forwarded to the council with the recommendation for approval. Any questions? Is there a motion? I move uh, forwarding this resolution to city council with a recommendation for approval. I'll second. second. Moved by Eric, seconded by Aaron Ammons. Question. You have a question, Charlie? Yeah, yeah. Um, how much danger is there of these funds being cut by the federal government entirely? We haven't gotten any direction from HUD at all. Um, they, that's what they stated um, for us to put in the annual action plan. Um, because we have a 30-day comment period, um, if there's any change, then if we don't state that it could proportionally be lowered or um, increased, then we would have to go through another 30-day uh, process again, which could take longer. So um, at this point, um, we aren't getting any direction regarding what the budget will look like. I know there's proposals, but um, I think right now they're, they're concerned about the continuing resolution and about funding it by, uh, for that. But um, these uh, actually, um, October 1st, is when the next federal fiscal year. So these would be um, funds that, um, yeah, that we would be getting. Um, that's more of the concern, I think, for the next year. But Eric? But uh, so these funds would be released to us, assuming the government stays open, in the current fiscal year. Um, no, these, this, this is what we would get after July 1st. Well, okay, uh, our we, next fiscal year, but mm -hmm. the current federal fiscal year. Which I think actually this would have come back from last October around. Um, yeah. So when they made a decision to do the continuing re resolution, then there would be like right. another resolution. Okay, so, so yeah, so this, so this pocket of money, assuming, assuming there's not a catastrophe this week, this pocket of money will <laughs> will be available. More than likely, we're just not know. We just don't know if it'll be at the same level or if there will be any kind of a decrease in funds. Bill. Um, yeah, I know you're reviewing um, the Lerman neighborhood and some other areas, or mostly that area, I guess, to see what kind of 
uh, if it would still qualify. Have there been any changes in the actual map or boundaries of CDBG? Not yet. We once we um, complete that survey, then our CD uh, target area map, we would would change that and up, we would update it. So the funds that this applies to, will that apply to the current map still? Um, or is it too early to say? Too early to say, yeah. Okay, thanks. Dennis. One of the projects you mentioned that um, I think has a lot of value is the neighborhood cleanup, a trash hauling feature that's offered. Is that through CD? GB, BD, CDGB funding? Part of it is community development block grant and part of it is city funds. And, you, and um, I know that the costs of um, doing it have risen. Some of the, uh, the, the in, some of what you earn from collecting has fallen. Is that correct? That there's some aspects of the, the recyclable material that isn't as right. valuable, valuable yeah. for recycling anymore? And uh, I think, that, well, yes. And then, um, uh, and then you also mentioned that um, staff costs, personnel costs have increased, which ultimately brings us to uh, the decision of making just one collection a year rather than the two. Yeah, well, at least you didn't take them all away because they're so valuable. Right. I'm sorry that they, they reduced because they really are very valuable. <coughs> and uh, I know that you take tons and tons and tons of things to either the dump or the recycling center. So... Thank you. Any other questions? Uh, we had a motion on the floor. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 All those opposed, same sign. Okay. That passes. Next up is resolution number 2017-04-025R, resolution approving modifications to the City of Urbana, Urbana Home Consortium Fiscal Year 2014-15, Fiscal Year 2015-16 Annual Action Plans. Go ahead, Kelly. Yes. Um, this item um, is a resolution improving modifications to uh, previous annual action plans in order to reallocate our home budget um, to allow for funding of projects that we had through a request for proposals. All of this um, is in order to make sure that we have our home commitments per home regulations. So um, we thought um, that uh, we would have these, these RFPs, um, and we did receive um, several, of which three were chosen. Um, Courage Connection for a tenant-based rent assistance program um, that will serve individuals and families who are literally homeless, and they're going to accept throughout the community, not just their clients. Um, Habitat for Humanity to um, provide affordable housing opportunities uh, with four new construction or rehab um, acquisition rehab projects. And then Navicor in collaboration with the Champaign County Community Reinvestment Group, which is made up of, of banks in, this, in the cities, um, they're going to administer a down payment assistance program to increase the supply of affordable housing available for low and moderate income households. So um, in order for us to meet our commitment by August, um, that's where we release this request and um, have this amendment to our annual action plans. Um, the funding comes from both the City of Champaign and the City of Urbana in our neighborhood revitalization projects into this con consortium-wide project. Um, so, um, again, the Community Development Commission will also consider these amendments at their uh, regular meeting tomorrow evening and any um, comments we can also share as well. So we recommend that um, this be recommended for approval. Bill? Um, how, how are we addressing the change in the emergency shelter over the winter? Is that part of this, uh, part of the home consortium or is that? It is not. Um, um, actually, they applied through the Champaign County Continuum of Care um, for the Emergency Solutions Grant, which is a uh, HUD to the state. Um, and um, because it was actually United Way that, that did the application on behalf of the men's shelter. Um, and they, uh, their allocation was less than 
um, the $25,000 threshold that the state requires for them to um, have an agreement directly with the state. So um, United Way, along with Crisis Nursery, their amounts together we will be administering on their behalf. So we will be submitting a, an application to the state for the projects, and then we will be administering those. Okay, that would be the emergency solutions grant. Then? Yes. Okay, thanks. Any other questions, Dennis? I can make a motion. Okay. To uh, send resolution 2017-04-025R to uh, council with approval. Second. Any further discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 All those opposed, same sign. Okay, that passes. And uh, last, well, I guess there's two more from CD. Resolution number 2017-04-026R, which is a resolution authorizing execution of an intergovernmental agreement with the Village of Rantoul regarding management of community development block grant funds. <clears throat> yes, um, the Village of Rantoul currently has no dedicated staff that are available to programmatically manage its community development block grant program. Um, with that in mind, village staff contacted the city of Urbana to inquire about the possibility of contracting with the city to temporarily manage their CDBG funded projects in Rantoul for a period of about six to nine months. Um, so the Grants Management Division, we prepared an estimate to undertake the requested services, um, but the estimate requires an intergovernmental agreement to be formalized. So um, the proposed agreement includes a required scope of services which the city will be obliged to complete um, and as well as any optional scope of services which they could ask us to complete if they need assistance. Under the required scope of services, city staff would prepare and submit the Village of Rantoul's CAPER, the Consolidated Annual Performance and Evaluation Report. This activity would require city staff to become familiarized with their um, projects and context, which will be billed separately as a flat fee in addition to the flat fee proposed for the caper. Under the optional scope of services, which could be entered into upon the village's request, city staff could also help to process applications for their grant activities, prepare environmental reviews for grant funded projects, and report um, any project details in HUD's integrated disbursement and information system, among other miscellaneous tasks. Um, the proposed intergovernmental agreement would provide additional funding to the city beyond the amount required to cover staff time benefits and some administrative costs. And it will enhance the city's ability to continue its current staffing levels, including the employment of a part-time community development associate. In addition to helping our gov intergovernmental partner, the city sees the agreement as an opportunity to potentially engage um, Rantoul and regional grant programs, such as possibly um, in our home consortium. Approval of this intergovernmental agreement does not commit any city financial resources to the project at this time, and it would uh, redirect staff to work on projects and reports related to Rantoul for at most nine months. And so we recommend approval of the resolution. Any questions? Mayor Pressing? Yeah, on the staff costs, is that just the flat salary, or do you, have you included the fringe benefits? And have you included benefits are included. And what about um, overhead? Indirect costs. Um, I believe we tried to figure those out. Libby could probably help answer that too. We asked the um, finance department about that, and we don't really have a complete handle on indirect costs. But there is some administrative cost provided there, and a lot of the work will be done by actually an hourly employee. So there's a very generous markup. Um, it's a small amount of hours over a temporary period of time. If we were going to go into the consulting business, then we would want to look at uh, some of those in, and try to define what some of those indirect costs are. But there's benefits to us at this point in terms of keeping our staffing at its current level so we can get our work done. Um, the 
grants, even though we're accessing more grants, the grants have tended to decline and we have had some staff reductions in recent years, so we're really pretty much at bare bones and this will help us um, in our budgeting to have a diversity of revenues. Any other questions? Is there a motion? Charlie. I'll move to Senate's Council recommendation for approval. I'll second. Moved by Charlie, seconded by Dennis. Any further discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 All those opposed? And last item on the agenda is uh, resolution number 2017-04-027R, which is a auth resolution authorizing execution of an intergovernmental agreement with the Village of Rantoul regarding a land bank feasibility study. Yes, um, this study would be carried out by um, STR Grants LLC, uh, which is a Fairfax, Virginia based firm that specializes in information technologies applied in government community development contacts. Um, they recently conducted a land bank fe feasibility study for the v Vermilion County Land Bank, um, and which is in the process of initiating operations at this time. Um, the, the estimated total cost of the study will be uh, a little over $17,000. The Village of Rantoul, acting as the lead entity for this study, is requesting all participating government partners to fund 25% um, of the study. Um, land banks are tools that many communities use to manage and mitigate the effects of vacant and blighted structures. Um, this single purpose public sector entities act as property owners with regard to owning and managing vacant and neglected properties. As public bodies, land banks are accountable to the desires and concerns of local residents and they can pr prioritize rehabilitation, demolition, resale or redevelopment um, based on the input that they receive. They also can take on a form of a variety of governance fo forms, but ideally their initial staff and activities are funded through seed money followed by revenues gem generated by real estate transactions. Um, so uh, the primary immediate benefit um, to the government partners was identified as being the ability to consolidate problem properties into an entity that would be managed by professional staff. And so um, in order to determine um, if it was feasible that we decided that to participate in this land bank study. Um, so we recommend approval of the resolution as attached. So uh, I recommend uh, approval or move the council with a recommendation for right. approval. Second. Moved by Ammons, seconded by Smythe. Any questions, comments? Charlie? Yeah, Kelly, I, I find this sort of interesting bookend to the very first thing that you mentioned earlier tonight, the program funding agreement that, that you passed out, which has money for demolitions. Uh, w you know, would we be able to, assuming we get this grant uh, for the, 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 the 71,000 that's mentioned here, would, be, would, be, would we be able to use it with the land bank uh, to help demolish and clean up some of those properties. So that might be a question to follow up on. Definitely I can do that. Yeah. So, I mean, this would, this would be the flip side of having a land bank, I think. See so, no further uh, questions. Will uh, all those in favor of passing this resolution on to council, please say aye. 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 All those opposed, same sign. Okay, that passes. And with no further business before the council, this meeting is adjourned. Thank you. Amen. <laughs>